I learned soon that actually push them on it, ask them what value and don't just settle for like, oh, network. So what I like to do is ask the person I'm speaking to, like what their favorite investment has been. Hopefully they can answer with specifics. Welcome to the investment season of How to Start Up, a podcast for anyone starting or scaling a company. Hosted by me, Juliet Fallowfield, founder of B Corp Certified PR, Communications and Podcasting Consultancy, Fallowfield and Mason, where we teach you how to own your PR in-house. Raising investment can be a daunting process, especially if you've never done it before. From knowing how to write a pitch deck to what type of investment is right for business, there are so many things to consider. So for our ninth season, you'll hear from successful founders and entrepreneurs on what we should be doing now, next or never when considering investment. If you have any questions on these topics or more generally on PR and podcasting, I'd love to hear from you at juliet at fallowfieldmason.com. I hope you enjoy the season. When raising investment, it's important to present your prospective investors with your financial information as clearly as possible. This is where a data room comes into play. In this episode, I speak with Laura Fullerton, the founder and CEO of Monk, creators of the world's first smart ice bath and cold water therapy app. After discovering that ice baths helped her regain control of her physical and mental health, Laura launched Monk to make cold water therapy more accessible. About to close a £2 million round, Laura breaks down what a data room is and what needs to be included in yours to successfully raise investment. Thank you so much for joining How to Start Up and talking all things data rooms today. But before we get stuck into that, I would love it if you could give a brief introduction as to who you are and a bit about the business that you have started. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. So I'm Laura Fullerton and I am the founder and CEO of Monk. And we're a health tech startup that is launching the world's first smart ice bath and cold water therapy app. When did you start doing this? Uh, About just over two years ago. Yes, we started product development at the beginning of last year. And finally, there is light at the end of the tunnel. We are getting ready to go into mass production. So yeah, it's a super exciting time. Incredible. I think you mentioned when we spoke last that the first prototype is landing in the country this week. Is that right? Yes. (gasps) Yes. I get to see it later today. Oh, no way. Oh, my yeah. goodness. This is hot off the press. That's so exciting. So this is a fantastically beautiful. I've seen designs, the most ergonomically delicious bath I've ever seen, but it also does amazing things for your health. Indeed. And thank you so much. I'm actually going to steal that ergonomically beautiful <laughs> <laughs> or delicious, sorry, delicious, even yeah. better. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's it's such a phenomenal tool for your you know mental, physical and emotional health. Our goal is to teach people how to use it safely and effectively. And actually, as of next week, you can come down and try it out in real life. I cannot wait. I cannot wait because I've I've observed this development for a while. And since we met, I think probably a year, year and a half ago in our co-working office, Mm -hmm. seeing your social, seeing the coverage that you've got on it, it's amazing. But because it looks so beautiful, and I think it was the FT that wrote it up, was how to spend it that covered it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So when you see something, how to spend it, you know, it's expensive and that is (laughs) worth it. But presumably to create something like that, it is a lot of funding needed to get that ready. You have gone through your own startup story and your own investment story. So it'd be wonderful if you could give a brief overview as to what that looked like to get here today. Yeah. So yeah, to your point, hardware is capital intensive. And so from day one, I knew we needed to raise money when it was just an idea in my head. I had nothing to show for it. And, you know, I've had two previous businesses, but I've bootstrapped them both. I've never thought about fundraising before. So to me, it was this quite scary new territory and I had no idea how to go about it. But I was so fortunate um, and we raised a friends and family round at the beginning of last year and I took 485,000 from a cohort of just amazing individuals. We had, you know, multi-billion pound founders and athletes, technologists and people that were just so passionate about what we were doing and really helped us move the needle. And that's really got us through to where we are today. And we are currently raising our seeds. So we're raising 2 million, which is going to fully take us to market, fuel a dual launch in the UK and US. You know, the current climate, it's been interesting time to fundraise. And it's been a very different experience to when I raised our friends and family around. Um, But yeah, I'm sure we're going to get more into that. Uh, Yeah, absolutely. And congratulations, because it has been the worst economic climate (laughs) to do anything in. I think anyone in any job anywhere is really struggling at the moment. So the fact that you're raising investment, you're developing this insane product that is just so incredible. Huge congratulations, because you are one of the most calm and rational people in our office. And you've got... (laughs) I don't know about that. (laughs) 
Um, so when we were chatting about the season around investment, one thing that you pointed out to me, oh, people need to know about data rooms. That's actually really helped us in our process. And I was like, well, what's that? So if you could just give your insight into what is a data room when it comes to investment. Yeah. So a like a virtual data room is a space where you can share confidential documents with potential investors like your financial model, details around IP, contracts with suppliers, your team, your cap table, all sorts of things like that. Because you don't really want to be just sharing these documents out and you know, you don't know whose hands they're going to get into. You kind of want to have a place to control that. And the beauty of it is, is that it's just really an efficient way to help potential investors see the materials they want to see and make a quicker investment decision, which is what you want, right? You want to get to yes or no quickly. I also see it as a really powerful tool because, yes, it enables investors to do their due diligence, but it's also a way to show them that you know what you're doing and to highlight certain things that you really want them to see. Presumably, security is key and making sure that only the right people see the information. And is it something that once that information is locked in the data room, it can't be downloaded or it can't be reshared? Presumably, there are hacks around it, but it's one step nearer to being super secure with that very precious IP. Yeah, totally. So you can have, you can set different preferences, like people could download it if you want them to be able to download it. But the important thing for me was that in one kind of smooth process, we could get people to sign an NDA before they enter the data room. We're set up on DocSend at the moment. And previously I used uh, DocuSign and then there was another tool for the data room and I had to manually get people to sign the NDA before I could then give them access. And I was also paying two subscriptions, which I didn't like. Um, So for us, DocSend has been great because, yeah, it's all in one place and it's really handy because you can create different links. So, you know, for existing investors and funds, like often funds just don't sign NDAs, particularly, you know, when you're talking to an early stage company like us. So I can send a link that basically bypasses that, but then to other like prospective investors and individuals, I can send them a different link that has that NDA on. So that's been really, really crucial for us. Anything, A, save one step in the process and anything that's super functional. And I think a lot of people kind of laugh at me and previous employees who are still working with other companies it's like oh you're so process driven you're so you know you've got all of your systems it's like you don't understand how precious time is and if Mm -hmm. it saves one more step and one thing is automated that irrespective of investment or anything in running a company is golden so I love that oh yeah totally agree process makes the world go round (laughs) yeah and it's not glossy or glamorous but it oh my good god when it works it's fantastic (laughs) yeah well in that case on that note two other things I think you're really like one would be for the pitch deck I also have that on docs end and it's great because it gives me complete version control so if we have a new version of the deck i just upload it and it keeps the same link which is great but it also tells me what pages investors have landed on and what they've spent time on which is great so before yeah so before i even speak to an investor i can look at the page they've landed on and see like okay they spent loads of time on team and investment maybe their things that are really important to them whereas someone else is maybe really interested in the go to market plan or products you can kind of just get a sense for where someone's at and what's important to them which will then help you have a better follow on conversation Absolutely. Well, that's really interesting because I was thinking when you started that, it sounds like a very secure Google Drive and we use Mm. Google Drive for all of our documents and we recommend it for a press library for journalists. It's a live link that never dies. We can update the images with new ones, delete old products. But this, the dwell time, you've got those analytics about where people are looking and you can get to know the investor better before you have that conversation. So anything to build that relationship faster. Totally. insanely smart. What was the other thing you were going to say? So the other thing was that I use Calendar for most things but (laughs) oh yeah here's the magic sauce (laughs) I have a um a separate or like a meeting set up as uh investment but also I just I have a different schedule for that because you know as a early stage founder you have to make yourself available for investors and particularly if we're talking to people in the US obviously it's a different time zone you just have to accept that you're going to have to you know, have your availability set to 7, 8 p.m., whatever it is, certain mm-hmm. nights. And so I have a different schedule for investment. And so whenever I send the deck over to someone, I'll always have that Calendly link. So, you know, they can choose a time that suits them. Because again, to your point, it just makes the process so much smoother. Yeah, that back and forth. And sometimes like, well, should we have a call to have a call about arranging a call? It's like, <laughs> no, here's a link. You work out when you're free, book it in, done. But yeah. I love the fact you could have one Calendly link that will override another 
And the same for us with existing clients, they will always come first and we want to make sure that they've got access to us. I mean, not that this conversation should be about hacks and efficiencies, but text auto replacement where you type an acronym and it pre-populates copy, game changer for links, email addresses, addresses, anything you say more than once, you can have your acronyms and everyone just again rolls their eyes at me, but I absolutely love it. (laughs) Yes. Well, you told me about that and I've already set up a couple, but I I would Uh, like your help in setting up some more. But yeah, things like that. I, I, yeah, this is the sad stuff that gets me excited. Same. It gives me great joy. And the team was saying, we're going to put you on TikTok with all your hacks. I was like, no, please don't, please don't. Oh, you should. (laughs) I don't want to be that person. But anything, anything to be efficient with time. So your time is better spent on things. And this data room for me screams efficiency, but also professionalism and investors. You want to have that tone set with them that you know what you're doing. You're in charge of your business. You understand your business, you've organized your business and that you're a trusted resource for it as well. Just in terms of the other platforms, have you trialed other platforms for data rooms? I think we, I tried to use DocuSend, but I don't think it allowed me to have the NDA and some other things. And some of them as well, they'll have the functionality, but you have to be on like an enterprise level account and it ends up costing so much. Yeah. So in a data room, I've talked to a lot of people about investment and they're saying, oh, it's communication with your investors on potential investors and it's having that level of professionalism and giving them what they need before they even know that they need it. And presumably the efficiencies that come with having a data room and all the documents saved up there comes with that. But what are the key documents do you think that should live in the data room? So I'll tell you how I've structured mine. And this, I'm sure, will be very different to other companies. Like one is more SaaS or tech. They'd probably have things that I don't have and vice versa. And equally, I'm sure a company raising their Series B would be very different to how mine's structured at the moment. But I have uh, five different sections. The first is business summary. So at the moment, I just have the cap table in there. Then I have financials. So we have our financial model. Um, And then we have a product development folder. And really that's where we have images, vectors of the hardware. We have uh, contracts, scope of work with the, you know, hardware, software teams, regulatory reports, all sorts of things like that. Then I have people and contracts. Um, That would be like full-time and fractional as well, um, as well as contracts with our board. Because I think one of the things when investors are looking at a business like mine is, you know, they want to know the management team and how it's set up. So actually just by showing them that actually, oh, we have a proper board and we have that kind of governance in place, I think is a big tick for us. And you're not hiding anything either. And they know that the person power behind the business as well, of who's actually going to get this done. Yeah. Oh, 100%. Um, Then we have governance. So we have our articles, EIS advance assurance, uh, shareholders agreement, and also all of my monthly investor updates. Because to your point earlier, having that key, like consistent communication with investors is is so important. And actually quite a few who I've been speaking to who have gone through the data have actually pointed that out and said, I love that you do that. So it really does work in my favor as well. And they've got a one-stop link to get what they need. So if they're like, oh, where was that piece of information? They just have to go to that one place and everything is there. There's no hunting in emails. Was it on WhatsApp? Was it a DM on LinkedIn? It's just there. Yeah, that's the thing. It's just, it's all about making it super easy for them. Mm -hmm. Um, And then my final folder is marketing and PR. So we have copies of all the press articles we've been featured in, like, you know, the Times, Telegraph, GQ, Financial Times, just everything like that, that really helps bring it to life and add some of that excitement. So they really understand the brand and business that they're potentially investing in. Because otherwise, data rooms, it's it's a fairly dry place. So at least if you can bring some of that excitement, I think it it really helps. I think with something like this, obviously, you need color and you need to activate and animate the business because investors, they're not just going to be looking at the numbers. They, and a lot of people have talked to me about this saying they look at the people, they look at the energy behind the founder. They want to get to know the person and know how passionate they are. But if you can go in with, I've got all of this together, super organized. Oh my goodness, Laura, you'd be an absolute dream to work with the fact that you're so efficient. They would have faith. Their faith is built in that. But actually really interesting that you've included the press clippings because I've asked a few people about this saying, does it matter if there is or isn't press coverage on a business when it comes to investment. And a few people have said, no, no, it's all about the numbers and the people and that will come. And for me, thinking about it, if you've had national press coverage on your business, it's that third party validation that it's real and it's actually got buzz. And this is pre-launch. This is, and I'm really impressed from a PR perspective that you've already got coverage on something that isn't actually available to buy yet. Or is it? Can people pre-purchase? 
nearly. Nearly. We're going to be going, yeah, pre-orders will be going live very soon. But yeah, to your point, I think people need to know that, you know, this is a consumer product. Having press coverage like that is, it's a huge, like, it's a huge point. And it's actually one of the things that a lot of investors bring up and they say, like, how did you get that? Um, so yeah, I think it's it's an amazing proof point that absolutely we need to to shout about. Well, totally. And it's other people saying that your business is valid and good and there's so much more to come. So you've rounded out the data room. You've got the financials, you've got the people, you've got the plan, you've got all your contracts. And it's way more detailed than I actually thought it was going to be. But there's nothing left. There's no rock for them to unturn. There's no nasty surprises around the corner. They can see everything if they want to. But even better, you can see where they're looking. So it's fascinating how it works. And anything that you wouldn't put in a data room? I don't think there's anything that we've decided not to put in there. I think the challenge for us being at such an early stage is there's probably a lot of things that should go in there that we just don't have yet. So yeah, as you develop and reach new stages as a company, then I'll constantly update it. But right now it's probably fairly basic, but I think at least just showing people, look, we've got this structure. And also it's just an insight into how you think. If it's like mm-hmm. well-structured and very logical and just makes their life easy. Yeah, um, yeah I think it, it just reflects really well. It's a hidden gem. It's something I haven't heard about before, but I'm fascinated by. I'm now thinking if we can use it for press libraries and PR pitching, because press could just go to our data room and find all of the information they need. It can be applicable just outside of investment as well. And then just more generally on your investment story, what do you feel like are the biggest mistakes that founders can make when it comes to investment? A lot of the podcast questions are anchored around what to do now, next and never when starting and scaling a company. So if there's any pitfalls that you'd like to flag to someone, that would be great. Yeah, I think probably taking on the wrong investors is the biggest mistake I see. And I I need to caveat this with, I have been so fortunate. Um, I've had the most amazing people that have, have come and supported me and backed me and are on this journey with me. But no, we've both witnessed people do this and it's heartbreaking. Yeah. I think people forget that this is a two-way interview. Like you're thinking about letting someone into your house that you've built, that you would live and die for. Like particularly if, if we're talking about early stage companies where, you know, the founders are likely the ones still running the business, um, you know, still raising the investment. Obviously, it's quite rare that you'd have an external CEO or someone to come in and do that. It's like you've likely sacrificed everything to bring this thing, this business to life like, you know, if you hire the wrong employees, it's fairly easy to let them go. But investors, like not so much, like you're getting into bed with someone or this fund, like you've got to, you've got to feel good about it. And it's so important to, to get it right. Because once you do, they're your biggest advocates, your biggest supporters and add so much value beyond capital. Yeah. And this is something that we covered in one of the previous episodes is how to ask your investor for additional support, because it shouldn't just be the financials. They, they, you could either become a mentor or they could open their little black book to other people that can help the business because they have an interest in you succeeding, that you need to be able to have a good relationship with that person. It's same with your team. If you have the wrong people in the business, you can waste so much emotional energy and thought on this. And it's often kept me awake at night of like, well, how do I fix this? And how do we help this person? And that's just me managing a team. Investors, where it's a long-term relationship and there is no real out, is super, super important. So what would you necessarily advise people to do at the beginning when they are looking for investment slash interviewing investors? So I would definitely speak to other companies they've invested in. And this has worked really well for me on two occasions. One time I spoke to someone and they just said, run. So that for me was a a hard no. (laughs) So I politely entered that conversation. And then actually it happened recently. I got introduced to a fund who were interested and I had heard from two of their portfolio companies that it taking their investment was the worst thing and it completely ruined their business. And they said the same thing. They're like, just don't, please do not consider it. And then I also know someone who, who knew them and just said they are the people that give funds a bad name. So you can, you can do a bit of background research, but also I think, particularly with funds, like so many of them say, hey, we add so much value more than just capital. But I learned soon that actually push them on it, like ask them what value and don't just settle for like, oh, network. So what I like to do is ask the person I'm speaking to, like what their favorite investment has been, and then ask what support and value they added there. And hopefully they can answer with specifics. I think also being a solo female founder, you'll have a lot of funds that say like, oh yeah, we support female founders. And so I just ask, oh, how many of you invested in this year? Mm -hmm. And just, 
push it on them, not in a facetious way, not that you're trying to catch them out, but just in a way that you're just doing your own due diligence. Yeah. Yeah. Because it does work both ways. A lot of the conversations we've had with our clients when they're building their relationships with press is setting the tone and setting that level of respect. And mm. the same with us and our clients. We are a partner and it needs to be that equal footing, which a lot of people are sort of surprised about. You have to set that tone really early on. Mm. Um, and are there any, in terms of what you may do now, next and never again, is there something that you look back on and you're like, I will never do that again. I learned the hard way on that. Ooh. I mean, I, I do every day. There's something that comes up. And, oh, another learning. You get very good at the humble about the learning curve because it's steep. <laughs> oh, yeah. Do you know what? This is a really hard one. I always remember someone saying to me with fundraising, like it never stops. And I thought, well, that's weird because once you've closed your round, then that's it. But actually, as soon as you close around, you're already talking to investors in, you know, for future rounds. And even if you don't know when you're going to raise, like you've got to build those relationships and that network. And I think that has probably been not the biggest learning for me, but I think one of the most valuable things any founder or CEO can have is their network. Mm -hmm. And so I've spent quite a lot of time. I'm, I'm part of a few members groups. There's one uh, called Adorium in London. There's one in the US called Baby Bathwater. And just being surrounded by incredible entrepreneurs and business leaders, it, it's just a great space to be in because good people know good people. So when it actually comes to you needing to raise money or, or whatever it is, just having that solid network is the, the best foundation you could possibly have. People underestimate how much emotional support you actually need when you're running a starting or scaling a company you are very vulnerable you're not behind for me I was at these lovely big luxury brands and you had an HR department and a payroll department you had departments whereas when you're in a startup and that's why I love our co-working office because none of us are in each other's businesses but we know when someone needs a cup of tea we know when someone needs to go for a walk you know when you like how was that thing last week that you were a bit worried about everyone's got each other's backs and that for me has been game changing. And people are like, why don't you work from home? It's like, because I need to be around people that are in the same boat. But also the advice sharing that we've all done with each other. And obviously this is where this podcast has been born from. It's just like, there's a lot of questions I have that I love to ask intelligent people and surrounding yourself with those people that are on your team and on your side, but equally add value. Like there's never a conversation I have in the office where I don't learn something from someone and hopefully offer something back as well. Um, but with investors, that's super crucial in terms of that network. We talked about this in the first episode of this season, but in terms of networking, a lot of people shy away from it and don't like doing it. Is there any hacks that you have around it? I think going to the right events, like when you go places and you feel like you're there to network and you're there with a goal, it just doesn't feel the same as when you're there with like a really well curated group of people and you're there just to, to develop relationships and friendships. And it just naturally comes up like, I don't know, someone has a problem. You're like, oh, I need to connect you with this person. Like, I love it when I can actually add value and connect people. I hate it when I feel like I'm somewhere just because I want to find new investors or, or something like that. But I think that's why I really lean into a couple of the groups that I'm part of. But also just to add to your point earlier, founders need support. And you mentioned like, hopefully you can give something back. The conversations we've had have really helped me, you know, when it came to like problems with team or something like it's, it's phenomenal. Problem shared is a problem halved. Completely. It's interesting because especially with the team, because you're the founder and they're your employees. And I always talk about the fact we're not hierarchical and we have a flat structure, but they will never really understand what it's like to be on my side of the fence as much as I try and be very transparent about our financials and with our B Corp, it's very important to be as transparent as possible. But no disrespect to them, they just can't understand what it's like to be in my seat. And that's why having other people around who are in the similar boats and not too similar as well, because it's interesting talking to people in tech startups, you know, we have nothing to do with, but we can look at it from an external consumer perspective or something like that. It's just, yeah, it's been game changing. So anybody listening probably knows throughout this whole podcast to join Soho Work works. So something that we do with each guest is there's a question from our previous guest that they would like to ask our next guest. And our previous guest was Venetia, who founded Ruby, the at-home beauty appointment booking app. Oh, I've used it. Yeah, it's brilliant, isn't it? Yeah, I it's great. It. Oh my God, she's fascinating. I have a lot of respect for what she's achieved. Her question for you is, what was the one thing that you did for your business that really moved the needle and enabled you to, to get where you wanted to be? Ooh, I think 
the structure around me has been really fantastic. So being a solo founder, like I never wanted to be a solo founder. I would have loved to have a co-founder, but there just wasn't the right person at the right time. And I remember sitting down with Lee, who's now my chairman, and we mapped out like, how could I get the right support without actually having a co-founder? And that meant bringing in people kind of as advisors. So for example, one of my investors is also our CFO. One of my other investors is also on the board and he's incredibly strong when it comes to marketing and strategy. So it basically just mapped out the skill sets that we needed to have. And I went and found the right people to fill those, but also invest in the business. So they're really doubling down. And that has been incredible. Well, also, because you've got that access to the seniority, because when you're a startup, you don't necessarily have the budget to afford really senior hires full time. And you need access for CFO. Maybe for us, it would be three hours a month, which would be fantastic. It's all we really need to have that senior eye. But obviously, that probably doesn't work for CFO that's wanting to leave a role and go into a next one. So that's an incredibly clever way of doing it. And what would your question be for our next guest? Oh, I need to figure out what I would ask. That was such a good question. It's really interesting. The one before that was was my friend Ed who asked Daisy from the deck, what cartoon character would you be? (laughs) I was like, this is amazing. And I was like, I'm Roadrunner, clearly. And she's like, I'm Roadrunner too. And we bonded over the fact that like racing through. But that was the really fun one. And he's like, I'm sure all of the other questions would be super serious. And Michael Tobin, who's an incredible serial entrepreneur, he asked, what was the piece of advice given to your younger self that still holds true? And it's really interesting what people want to ask a founder because you, a similar thing in terms of sharing advice and co-working place, when you're a founder, you've got those questions that you never really sort of sit down and think about mm. of like, God, if I had a magic wand, if somebody could answer me this or, or you're just curious and it doesn't have to be about investment either. Okay. So my question, and this might sound a little dry, but I want to know what does that person do or how do they pull themselves out of a hole when they're having a really bad day? Yes. It's so true because Instagram lies, let's be honest. A lot of people are like, oh my God, you're self-employed. You have endless holiday and you're completely free to do whatever you want. I'm like, are you joking? I like, no, that does not happen. And you have bad days and it's I weirdly ironic because you have really tough days in a job that you've made up for yourself. <laughs> Yes. And it's not fair because it's like, well, hang on, I made this job up. Why am I, you know, because we're doing stuff we've never done before. And I think a lot of people don't remember that. And when you only when you're in it, and that's someone else said this to me, is that you'll never get a job for anyone else ever again because a founder knows what it's like to be a founder and they mm. know the freedom that you've afforded yourself and they know that you know. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh God. Yeah. It works both ways. Um, but yeah, you definitely get tough days, really tough mm-hmm. days. And it, you feel far more at the coal face and less protected than you'll ever before. But the flip side to that is that you have epic days and more amazing days than you get bad days. But yes, what do you do? Well, what do you do, Laura, when you have a tough one? Ice bath, presumably. <laughs> that genuinely, it really helps. It really helps to reset. I also do breath work and that helps. It's just like a state shift. But one of the things I do, and I told one of my friends this, she's not an entrepreneur, she's not a founder. And after I told her, she looked at me and just said, are you okay? <laughs> and so what I do is I come home and one of my favorite business books is called The Hard Thing About Hard Things. It's fantastic. And there's a a chapter in it called The Struggle and it lists out like what the struggle is. And somehow it gives me just a little bit of peace knowing that I'm not the only person going through this. And yeah, it somehow just makes me feel slightly more reassured. But I think to someone who isn't a founder and doesn't get it, they would think like, you need help. (laughs) Definitely. I had a conversation last night with a friend and he's saying, oh God, I feel like that all the time. And it's just knowing that you're not alone in this in Mm. any way. And you're definitely not the first person to have felt like this. You're definitely not the first person to have this problem. You might not know the answer, but that's the beauty of information sharing and the fact that people like to help other people. And is there any last golden nugget pieces of advice you'd like to offer founders when thinking about data rooms? Sorry, I thought you were about to say when thinking about dating. (laughs) Well, that too. (laughs) Yeah, that's a whole other podcast series. (laughs) Yeah, you need a separate Calendly link for that. I think the one thing to think is just make the process as seamless as you can for you and for the investor. Yeah, ideal. Thank you, Laura, so much. It's been wonderful chatting to you and I've learned a lot. Thank you so much for having me. 
If you'd like to contact Laura, you can find all of her details in the show notes along with a recap of the advice that she has so kindly shared. We'd love to hear from any listeners on your experience raising investment to include in our next episode. Please email us at hello at fallowfieldmason.com. Thank you for listening to How to Start Up. I hope these conversations offer you some confidence, encouragement and reassurance that you're on the right track. If you've enjoyed this podcast, I'd be so appreciative if you were to rate, review and subscribe as it will really help other people starting a company discover it.